Chairman, the meeting is now being live streamed. Thank you very much and a very good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this virtual meeting of Cornwall Council's Standards Committee being held on Tuesday, the 27th of April at 10 o'clock. Before consideration of today's business, I will outline the protocols for the meeting. Today's meeting is being live streamed to the public via Microsoft Teams and is also being recorded. If the Council's live stream fails during the meeting and we cannot share the proceedings, I will adjourn the meeting so that access can be restored. If the issues cannot be resolved, I will halt the meeting and the remaining business will be concluded at a future date. If a member experiences a technical issue, I will adjourn for a short period to try and re-establish their connection. As I call members to speak, I will remind you to switch on your microphone. Uh, if for any reason you cannot be heard, the Democratic officer will advise you. I will ask you please not to put your cameras on unless you are speaking. And once you have spoke, spoken, to switch your cameras off to try and preserve our bandwidth. I will indicate when we are going to move to a vote and the Democratic service officer will declare the result. The vote will be taken by roll call. We don't have any public participation in today's meeting. However, the public can watch the proceedings by accessing the live stream via the link in the agenda on the Council's website. Where a member has declared a non-registrable interest or a disclosable pecuniary interest or an interest by virtue of membership of a trade union, uh, they must leave the virtual meeting. Their departure will be confirmed and they'll be invited to rejoin the meeting at the appropriate time. We do not plan to go into closed session today, but should the press and public be excluded from the meeting, members will be required to in turn confirm and declare there is no other persons present who are not entitled to either hear or see consideration of any matters. Uh, these are confidential items and we don't have any on today's agenda. To confirm the procedure for today's meeting is that committee members who wish to speak on an item should indicate with an X in the chat box. I'm aware that uh, Tony Williams doesn't have that facility, but he does have the hands up facility and Tony will be the only one who will use the hands up facility as the rest of us will use the X in the box. Before we start the meeting, I'm going to ask our Democratic Service Officer, which is Debbie Bolton, who joins us today uh, to confirm um, Please, uh, the committee meeting, uh, the committee members that are present by asking for their name and their electoral division for non elected members, uh, for them to confirm their name and their role on the committee, either an independent member or town or parish member or clerk representative. Uh, Debbie, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll start with the, the committee members. Um, Councillor Alvey. Good morning, Martin Alvey, uh, Councillor for Fiok and Plain Place. Thank you. Councillor Frank. Good morning, everybody. I'm Hilary Frank and I represent the good folk of Saltash South. Thank you. Councillor Gammon. Good morning, Councillor Jackie Gammon, Bogman St Mary's Division. Thank you. Councillor Jenkin. Good morning, Mitinda. I'm Loveday Jenkin and I represent Crowan and Wendron Division. Thank you. Councillor Nicholas. Good morning. I'm Councillor Sue Nicholas and I represent Marazine Perinothno Division. Thank you. Councillor Pugh. Good morning. I'm Richard Pugh and I represent the Trelawney Division. Thank you. And Councillor Wills. Hello, good morning. I'm Councillor Paul Wills and I represent the St Cullen Major Electoral Division. Thank you. And our independent non-elected members, Robert Bishop. Good morning, Robert Bishop, independent member. Reg Davison. Good morning, Reg Davison, independent member. Professor Mel Dean. Good morning, I'm Meryl Dean. I'm an independent member. Thank you. And our parish and town council representatives, David Edwards. Good morning, David Edwards, both is Glenning Parish Council. Thank you. Uh, Tony Woodhams. Tony Woodhams, uh, Bree Parish Council. Thank you. And our parish uh, town clerk representative. 
Good morning, Sally Vincent, Town Parish Clerk representative. Thank you. Um, Chairman, I can also confirm that the following officers are on today's meeting call. Simon Mansell, Group Manager Assurance. Ellie Garraway, Corporate Governance Officer. Judith Fields, Customer Services Lead. Keith Cheeseman, Service Director, Adult Social Care Modernisation. Kerry Lewis, Service Manager, Charging and Assessment, Adult Care and Support. Jenny Payne, Head of Customer Experience and Improvement, Customer and Business Operations. Debbie Bolton, Democratic Officer, and Ian Buckingham, who is our live stream operator today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Debbie. Uh, before we start today's business, I must remind all members that are standing for election that we are in a period of purda. So uh, if at any time I feel or any of my senior officers or the vice chair feel that uh, you may be in breach of purda rules, you will be reminded of that fact. I'm sure none of you will. We are not really a political committee um, and I'm sure there'll be no electioneering or bandstanding uh, during this meeting. I'm also pleased to report to you all before we start the meeting that the code of conduct uh, as we presented to full council, uh, which was worked on by the working party, was approved at the last full council meeting by Cornwall Council. It's now gone to town and parish councils um, for their approval. Uh, let's go to apologies for absence, please, Debbie. Thank you, Chairman. We have apologies from Councillor Tudor, Gloria Challen and Hugh Wood. Thank you. Declarations of interest, please, members of the committee. If you have a declaration of interest, can you indicate now by putting a cross in the box uh, or in Tony's case, the raise your hand function, please. I can see no cross in the box, no raise your hand function, so I will assume that there are no declarations of interest. Uh, we'll move on to item three and four, which we're going to take together uh, and have one vote. That is the minutes of the meeting held on the 25th of January, which is pages one to five in your agenda pack. And the minutes of the extraordinary meeting held on the 4th of March 2001, which is pages six to eight. We will go, first of all, Richard, uh, sorry, did somebody put a cross in the box there? Uh, Richard Pugh, did you put a cross in the box? Do you wish to say something, Richard, before we move on? Yes, I, I just wanted to speak about item two on page two. Of the, uh, of, of the, of the minutes, Richard? Yes, yes, the minutes. Yeah, by all means, when we come to that, I will come to you. Okay. Thank you, Richard, thank you. So uh, let's go to, uh, first of all, which is the minutes of the meeting held on the 25th of January, which is pages one to five uh, in your pack. Uh, any questions or queries, please, on page one. You can raise your point when we get to it, Richard. OK. Any questions or queries, please, on page two. OK. Yes, Richard. Yeah. I raised the issue of enforcement at, the, at that particular meeting and uh, I was told that somebody would get back to me, but nobody did. I assume that's because the item was actually placed onto the um, work programme, which will be presented to the uh, standards in uh, January 22. I believe that is the case, Richard, yes. Okay, then. That's fine, then. That's all yeah, I wanted to know. Part of the work programme. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Any other questions or queries on page two? Page three? Page four? Page five? Turn the page then to page six for the um, minutes of the extraordinary meeting. Any questions or queries, please, on uh, page six, which is indeed page one of the extraordinary meeting. Page two. And finally, page three. I propose then that the minutes of the meeting that was held on uh, the 
25th of January and the extraordinary meeting held on the 4th of January uh, be accepted as a true and accurate record of that meeting. Uh, and I ask my vice chair to uh, second that, please. Uh, I'm happy to second that. Perhaps we could also note that the council did approve the revised code of conduct subsequent to that meeting. Yeah, I did mention that in my introduction as well, but yes, by all means. Okay. Thank you. If we could go to the vote, please, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so it's been moved by Councillor Wheel, seconded by Councillor Loveday Jenkin, that the minutes of the Standards Committee meetings held on 25th of January 2021 and 4th of March 2021 were correctly recorded and that they be signed by the Chairman. And if we could go to a roll call, uh, members, it's uh, for, against or abstain. Councillor Alvey. For. Councillor Frank. Four. Councillor Gammon. Four. Councillor Jenkin. Four. Councillor Nicholas. Four. Councillor Pugh. Four. Councillor Wills. Four. Thank you, members. Chairman, the, the minutes of both meetings have been approved. Excellent. Thank you very much, members. Uh, let's move on to item five on the agenda, which is the organisational complaints report, which is on page nine to 50 uh, in your packs. Uh, before we do, I must draw your attention, please, members, to page 16. I will ask you all to uh, find page 16. Just give you a second to do that. Um, halfway down the page, you'll see fig two complaints received by the uh, LGSCO quarter three 2021 at the end of that diagram there you'll see january february and march and there are no figures for 202021 however we will be given those figures uh, now during this meeting unfortunately we weren't ready in time for the publication uh, of our agenda packs uh, but we will be given those figures so you can write those figures in to the columns there at uh, the um, appropriate time uh, when uh, Ellie um, comes to that. So I will hand over to Ellie Galloway who is going to uh, uh, present the report to us. Ellie, a very good morning to you. Good morning all, and thank you very much Chair for that introduction. Um, going on from what you just said, I might as well go straight into the quarter four stats. Um, as previously mentioned by Council Wills, unfortunately they weren't ready in time to be um, included in, in, in your agenda pack. Um, but overall in quarter four we had a total number of 28 complaints. Um, in January it was eight, in February 14 um, and in March it was six. Um, further sort of the analysis of those complaints and comparisons and stuff will be given at the next standards committee meeting. OK, so going on to um, today's um, agenda. Um, so before you lies uh, the quarter three report for um, the Ombudsman, so that's the LGSCO um, and the organisational complaints report uh, for corporate complaints. Um, in respect of the ombudsman, um, of ombudsman complaints, we've received 29 um, in the last in in quarter three, um, which is pretty much on a par to the previous year, which was 28. So a very very small increase just of one complaint. Um, we have um, oh yeah, I've already touched on quarter four, so I won't mention that again. Um, in respect of decisions, um, we've um, had five upheld decisions in total. Um, three of which were for adult social care, one for environment um, and one for revenues and benefits. Um, and this compares with three in total um, upheld matters compared with the same period of the previous year. So a very slight increase, but an increase nonetheless. Um, we are seeing a sort of a more of an even kill with previous year's quarters uh, with a number of complaints and decisions. Um, and that's obviously um, sort of showing that lockdown is easing and obviously the, the Ombudsman have, have been sort of catching up with their caseload. Obviously in last quarter, the, um, the amount of complaints and decisions were very low during to the Ombudsman taking a short sort of re, re, um, a break from, from dealing with complaints. Um, in respect of any um, compensation payments that were paid out in quarter three, they were a total of three, three compensation payments, um, totaling um, 1,200 in total. 
um, this were they were all for um, adult social care. Um, and last year there was two compensation payments. Um, sorry, two patient two compensation payments, and they one being for adult um, one being for adult social care. Um, it should be no, uh, noted that no payments have been written off. Um, so a full summary of the complaints received by the Ombudsman um, received is shown on Appendix 2 um, and this also details the responses from Step 1 and Step 2 and if applicable um, outline any of the Council's recommendations um, and whether we've complied or not. Moving on to corporate complaints, um, we have um, we have 90, just over, so 90, just over 94 percent of step one complaints um, were dealt with within the council's agreed time scales. Um, this falls below the council's target of 100 um, percent, and it should be noted, but it should be noted that adult social care um, and together the family statutory complaints were all completed within time. Um, the total of 10 complaints were received late, um, six, sorry, were completed late, um, six with um, economic growth and developments, um, three in neighbourhoods and one in Together for Families. So a total of 199 complaints were received compared with 261. So it is, it is down from the previous, previous year for the same period. Um, and this also includes the adults, adult social care and Together for Families. Um, and 74 complaints of the step ones um, were upheld, which is exactly the same as the previous year. Um, in respect of step two complaints, we've had a total of 34 across the council, um, and this compares with 33 for the same reporting period the previous year, so pretty much on a par again. Um, the highest of these um, complaints is in relation to um, economic economic growth and development, which includes planning, um, and that was 12, 12 out of the 34 with the planning. Um, however, it should be noted that they often deal with very complex complaints and that should be should be taken into consideration. So again, unfortunately, the council have failed to respond to um, all their complaints, step two complaints within time. The target is 100% again as, as, as step one, um, and it's just over 91% we've completed in time. Um, three were late, um, one in housing and two in planning. Um, there was a total of nine step two cases, so obviously not, 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 not a massive amount. Um, Sorry, I'm just getting my head around. No, sorry, nine of which were upheld or previous upheld. Sorry, not a total of nine. OK, um, and finally, um, as you can see on page 24 of your report pack, um, I'm pleased to say that the um, compliments remains high. Um, it's just um, decreased slightly from 399 last year to 381 this year. So very, very small decrease, but the, it still very, remains very high. So like I said, examples are the same as shown on page 24. Um, that, that sort of concludes my sort of analysis of the report, but I'm happy to take any questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Ellie. Any questions, please, can you indicate by putting an X in the box? Um, or raise your hand function, please. In Tony Willem's case. Yes, thank you. Uh, Rob Bishop, first of all, please. Rob. Thank you, Mr Chair. If I may say to you, Ellie, it's uh, good to see all that data. One thing I picked up was that um, on the planning side, the three w that were held back was uh, were caused by the line manager being absent. But surely I would have thought there was a line manager's deputy who could have dealt with it. Is this the, or the case or not? Ellie. Thank you, Rob. And um, that's something that I'd have to look into. I don't have the information on top of my head, but I will um, report back to you separately, separately to the committee, if that's OK. I'm happy with that. I think it would resolve the problem. Thank you, Rob. Councillor Jenkins, please. Lovely. Yeah, um, just just in my experience of planning, I think it's a capacity issue, Rob. Um, and I suspect there needs to be some sort of feedback loop function 
that needs to happen to go to a different line manager if your line manager's off that probably isn't there in the system. Um, but they do have a capacity issue. I'm aware of that. Okay. Okay, thanks for that, uh, love day. Any other questions, please, uh, for Ellie on the organisational complaints report? Now's your chance. Yeah, Ellie, you wish to come back. Yeah, thank you, Chair. There was one point which I wanted to just quickly raise, which I noted was raised in the last meeting, which unfortunately I wasn't I wasn't present in, um, and it was actually shown in the in the agenda, um, and it was in respect of um, it was actually in respect of an enforcement case, whereby it was the question was asked well, um, uh, of of the delays. It was an upheld complaint. Let me just get the um, the minutes in front of me a moment. Sorry, I'm not very it's fine with that. Uh, just switch your camera off, Love Day, if you're not speaking, please. So yeah, the question was asked. Um, there was an upheld complaint. It was a planning enforcement matter, um, and it, there was a compensation payment of two hundred pounds. Um, and the, a, a member asked why, um, why, how long, why there was a massive delay, and how, no, sorry, what were the length of the delay with was with dealing with that matter. And I can confirm it was just over a year, and that's why the complaint was made. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jenkins. Love day. Yeah, uh, just two points. What one on one on that, which I think you know is a concern across the council, and we have hoping that the new council will set up a working group to look at planning enforcement processes um, to see if they can be um, speeded up in any way. Um, but also um, on the LDS CO, um, although they've been slow they're starting to get to the stage where they will be looking at complaints that have come through within the new system that's been set up in adult social care so i hope by july we'll be able to um, assess whether that's working or not excellent thank you sue nicholas please sue hi thank you yeah i mean it it's it's right it's the as, as Loveday said it's the capacity for enforcement but I do think that that team needs to be significantly increased to deal with it I've got 27 outstanding um, enforcement reports in my division alone so goodness knows I mean it'd be quite interesting to get um, an idea of how many are outstanding across the county yeah but we must certainly be, and I think yeah. also the quality of the application forms we're still getting information, you know, application forms through on planning that have a, appalling mapping with them and, you know, questions and, or rather answers to the questions on the forms that clearly are not accurate at all. So I don't know how you deal with that, except send it back every time that somebody sends in one that's, that's inaccurate. But yeah, it is a problem. Yeah, and we must remember the remit of our committee, and that is that uh, if it goes to the uh, local government ombudsman, that's when when we can we can look at it. But it is in the works program. We will be discussing that uh, when we come to the works program uh, later on. Any other questions, please? If there are no further questions, the recommendation is the committee is asked to note the local government and social care ombudsman complaints report and consider if any additional analysis and or actions are required. Well, we haven't done that, but we have considered the report and I'm happy to propose that we accept uh, the report uh, as written. Um, are you happy to second that, Vice Chair? Happy to second that, Chair. Thank you. We will then go to the vote. Uh, Debbie, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, members, the recommendation as set out on page nine has been moved by Councillor Wills and seconded by Councillor Jenkin that the committee note the local government and social care ombudsman complaints report. Uh, can I go to the vote, please? Councillor Alvey. Four. Councillor Frank. Four. Councillor Gammon. Four. Councillor Jenkin. Four. Councillor Nicholas. Four. Councillor Pugh. Four. And Councillor Wills. Four. 
Thank you. Chairman, the recommendation has been approved. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, moving on then to the next item on the agenda, which is the uh, item six, the ethical standards complaint, pages 50 to 55 uh, in your report. Uh, Simon is going to uh, pr uh, uh, present the report to us. Simon, a bit thin on the ground this time round, I think, but there is a reason for that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for members, um, as we're in Perda, um, the decision was made not to report um, all the complaints about whom, who was made the complaint, why it was made, um, etc. They will all be reported to the committee in July. And we're also doing an analysis of the breakdown between complaints against different councils as well. And that will be in the July report and also in the annual report as members that have been uh, members of the committee for a while will know. So overall, it's just a, a, a bare facts about the numbers of complaints we've had. Um, at the time of compiling the report, there was 177 complaints have been made. At the end of the year, there was a total of 191 complaints were made. Um, this is far in excess of any complaints we've had before. The highest number previously was 165 and there was 137 complaints in the last six months of the year. Um, which is more than we received for the entire year, the year before. Um, this has created its own problems in terms of administration, but we are working through them. And fortunately, we're in um, probably the wrong term of phrase, a honeymoon period before the elections. We've only had six complaints um, this year so far. So the, the complaints made in the first part of the new reporting period is more in line with what we would expect. Um, I said there will be a full report brought to the committee in July, but I'm happy to take any questions if there are any just on this bare report as it is. Thank you, Simon. Uh, any questions then, please, members? Indicate if you uh, have a question. Yeah, we go straight to, uh, I think, yeah, straight to Councillor uh, LV Martin. You have a question. Thanks, Chair. Yes, and, and, and I appreciate Simon can't go into any, um, any great detail. But uh, does he feel that this big ballooning in complaints is, is, is linked to COVID and the way that things are going to be done very differently and clearly contact with members and such like will have been uh, affected by COVID? So, so really, is, is, is there a COVID link to it or does he, does he believe that it's, it's separate to COVID, the reason that there's been a, a ballooning in complaints? Oh, I, I think it is the um, the on, onset of virtual meetings, um, the, the ability of some people to engage with virtual meetings, the ability of some members to engage with virtual meetings, and then the increase in use in social me media during COVID as well. So that, that that would be my overall sort of neutral analysis of it, um, look, looking at the complaints as we've received them. Thanks. I, I, I suspected as much. So the, basically the indirect link to COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And as Simon said there, members, um, we will have a full and comprehensive report uh, to the committee in July. And I expect it will make some very interesting reading, quite long reading for you all when we when we receive that. Um, but the reasons obviously why we haven't got uh, that full report in front of us um, have been made clear to you. Um, if there are no further questions, then the recommendation, just very quickly, are there any further questions? doesn't appear so. Is the Standards Committee asked to note the ethical standards complaints report and consider any uh, actions or further analysis uh, uh, as required? We don't have any further analysis and I'm happy to propose that we accept the report and I ask the Vice Chair if she's happy to second. Happy to second Chair. Thank you very much Loveday uh, and once again we'll go to the vote Debbie. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the recommendation as set out on page 51 uh, has been moved by Councillor Wills and seconded by Councillor Jenkin that the Standards Committee note the Ethical Standards Complaints Report. If I could go to the vote, please. Councillor Alvey. Four. Councillor Frank. Four. Councillor Gammon. Four. Councillor Jenkin. Four. Councillor Nicholas. Four. Councillor Pugh. Four. And Councillor Wills. Four. Thank you, Members Chairman. The recommendation's been approved. 
Thank you very much, Debbie. Uh, on to item seven on the agenda, which is the works programme, uh, pages 56 to 64 uh, in your uh, agenda packs, members. Simon. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, and for members of the committee, what I've set out to do with drafting this on behalf of the committee is to put into the works programme the key areas of work that the committee have um, said that they would like to see going forward in 2021 and into 2022. And the works programme is obviously subject to amendment by the committee, but the idea will be that once it is approved, I can then use that as a basis for the report that I bring to the Standards Committee in July, and then to reconstitute some of the working groups that are already in existence and to set up new ones that are needed. Um, for example, the looking at the planning enforcement complaints, which has been already mentioned uh, in, the, in the previous matter. Uh, one, the idea, the members wish to set up a, a working group to look at these. This has to be linked to uh, local government and social care ombudsman complaints because that is within the remit of the committee. But this is something that the, the committee can do and can set up if it wishes. And by adopting the work programme, this gives an indication to the, the standards committee going forwards what it would like to see. Um, the annual report um, is mentioned in the July meeting that will be presented. It says it was a delay due to PERDA. It's only been delayed from this month, but it will be presented to the committee in July. Um, other items which will be carried forward would be um, the review of the guide of the to intimidation and the recommendations to committee and standards in public life. We're still waiting confirmation from central government as to when they will change the legislation uh, to bring back suspensions, but there will be a considerable amount of work for the uh, committee to do then. And the, there's been a wish to continue the adult social care uh, complaints working group and hopefully um, we can um, go back to face to face meetings at some point in the future and then recommence the recruitment to the standards committee and look at recruiting independent persons. Uh, those are all things that are picked up on. Members may wish to add to this. Uh, they may wish to add to the report or change the reports, uh, the, the, the reporting period. So if they want something brought forward in October rather than January, uh, please, you know, open to suggestions. Debbie will capture them all and what I'll do is I'll amend the work programme after um, we've had all the feedback from members and I'll recirculate it to the committee then. I'm happy to take any questions on it, but obviously members may have suggestions as well. Absolutely. And if you do have suggestions, you're more than welcome to bring them here now uh, or between now and when we meet in July, um, you can by all means uh, drop um, Simon a line, copy me in on it as well and Loveday in on it as well. Uh, we're happy uh, to look at any suggestions that any members uh, of the committee have uh, to um, put uh, anything onto the works programme. Um, Councillor Frank, please, Hilary. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Simon. It's, you've given a lot of thought to this uh, work programme, so thank you very much for that. And it's just to pick up actually on page 57 with 2.4. Um, um, I'm really pleased to see that there is that uh, reviewing the guide on intimidation. Um, just uh, a minor point, just to prove I've read it. I'm doing it here. Um, um, it should be a focus, a focus on bullying with a Y in it, because at the moment it says bullying. But okay. apart from that, but um, apart from that, I, I note that we said earlier that um, probably an increase in the in number of complaints is related to um, social media um, and the increase of uh, the use of social media over COVID. And I'm wondering that in, intimidation with a focus on bullying, intimidation and harassment, can we cover social media in that? Is that within our remit? And if so, uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, there'll, be, there'll be nothing wrong with that. And I've had an email from Count this morning saying they want to do a particular fo a national focus on bullying. And would Good. the committee be interested in joining with that? And I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn for the committee, but I will engage with Sarah prior to the committee meeting in July, obviously. Um, Brilliant. But social media, without a doubt, and it, it, it is across the board, i.e. Across, across England as well. This isn't just in Cornwall. OK, lovely. Thank you. As members are aware, we have produced a guide on intimidation and bullying, which uh, has been sent out to all members as well as a pocket guide as well. Um, and it was agreed that uh, we will review that. Um, uh, and I think that's important that we review that on probably on an annual basis uh, because things change and move uh, so quickly these days that uh, in order to make sure that uh, councillors are 
um, confident in in the systems that are there, it's important that we do uh, keep up to, up to date with it um, and meet regularly to discuss that. But thank you very much for that, Hilary. That's most helpful. Uh, Rob Bishop, next, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Simon, uh, for all that diligent work as usual. Uh, on page 57, um, the bottom bullet about uh, the standards in public life. I think that needs to be at the, if I may say, at the beginning of our uh, work plan. And should we actually be waiting for the work plan to come out in, in July and do it? Because we don't have the tools, we don't have the suspension, and we don't have the voting rights. And this has gone on for years. We need to do something about it. And, and now is probably a very good time saying, we're just electing a new council, and they don't have the tools to do the job in the standards committee. I'll, come, I'll with, come to another point in a minute. Um, with, with regards to that point, Rob, um, the, the committee, as, as you know, has, has been through the recommendations from the Committee on Standards in Public Life and has adopted as many of the recommendations as is possible without the, the change in legislation that's needed to bring suspensions back in. Um, the Ministry last September we're promising a consultation on this, it never materialised. Um, however, I've got a meeting with the Ministry on Friday and if anything comes out of that, I will update the Standards Committee on it. But in terms of it, it's likely to be they will consult first and then they will look at the consultation responses. If the consultation falls within the meetings of the committee, then we will consult with the committee sort of as is so some sort of response can be sent to the ministry in the interim, but the, 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 the standards committee will have to be reconstituted after annual council with the Cornwall councils then appointed to it. So we, we, we will see where we are when something comes out, but you know, it, it will not, it will not be forgotten. <laughs> no, and it's important to remember about the, um, the, the changes in primary legislation, isn't it Simon? Because we can't do anything until that legislation has gone through parliament. Um, and that, that's, that's where it's being held up at the moment, Rob, but fully understand the frustrations of yourselves and other members of the committee, not only here at Cornwall Council, but throughout the country as well, because we have been promised this, um, as you say, uh, for quite some time now. Um, and now is the time really for central government to stand up, bite the bullet and actually put this legislation onto the statute book um, to allow standards committees to have um, teeth, as it were, uh, in being able to deal with uh, um, the, the, uh, serious complaints instead of being perceived um, as a toothless tiger. Um, your second point, Robert. Thank you very much for that, Chair. I do think it's time they had a, a bit of Kita. Um, <laughs> Simon knows what that stands for. Uh, my second point, <laughs> Um, it covers the um, legislation, uh, not the legislation, the planning and enforcement. Um, I can remember when I was interviewed by you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, and the team. And one of the nice questions you threw my way was uh, that towards the end of the interview was, uh, what would you like to be doing, or do you think the standards committee should be doing to improve uh, ethical standards? And I can recall very vividly saying we seem to keep waiting for the LG SCO to come up and then we fire fight. And I said perhaps we should be preempting the complaints that are going to go to the LG SCO. And lo and behold, we now have the opportunity to do this. Um, I understand what you're saying, what Simon's saying as well about the Constitution. Um, but I also understand the Constitution says that the Chief Executive is the person responsible for heads of department. What I would suggest is that when we come to this in the work plan, we have a form of words that says we consult with the Chief Executive to try and improve the situation with uh, uh, enforcement. Is it a matter of openness? Is it a matter of uh, needing more people, as Sue says, etc.? But it certainly needs to be looked at. And I don't see any barriers. I, I looked in the Constitution. I don't see anywhere where it says we should not be doing this to try and prevent problems. Is that fair? Simon. Um, with regards to it, 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 it Everything is on the table for the, um, you know, the, the committee uh, through the working group to consider. Um, 
I, I have engaged prelim in a preliminary measure with the um, head of planning about this and that she is aware that th this is on the work program. She is aware it is linked to complaints, but in terms of it, Rob, I mean, it, you know, the work you've done on some planning matters with regards to adult social care, looking at the prevention of complaints, this th this has all been effective. You remember back um, to the planning matters previously, yeah. you know, it, it, it was an extremely productive sessions that were yeah. had with the standards committee and it's hoped that, that that can be then built on and carried forward with, with, with the other elements in the work stream, you know, and, and for planning enforcement matters going forward. Yeah, but no, I, I agree with that, Simon. Um, but the opportunity is here now for us to include uh, the chief executive with us. Take take her with us. I I I, I would perhaps go with more with, with with the head of service first, as you have done in the past. Well, I, my point here is that we don't seem to get too far with the head of service. He keeps getting butted back to us, especially in planning. Um, I, I think that, like I said, with, with the previous um, work, the, the, well, the, the Standards Committee has done two sessions on planning. One was to do with an item uh, which was out on the lizard and there was then planning issues in general. And on both occasions, engaging with the planning and the deputy head of planning did prove uh, productive in the end. And I think that you would, my advice to the committee would be to work within the heads of service and the head of planning first and then to see what, what the outcomes of that were in the same way that you're working with the heads of service for adult social care. Uh, I reserve judgment. <laughs> okay. Anything else, Rob? Uh, I have a form of words that we could put into the work plan. Should you need them, Simon? Uh, it's entirely at the discretion of the, of, 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 the, of the committee, Rob. I'm I'm just here to advise the routes that have been taken previously, which have worked. Yeah. But I, I'm happy if the committee wants to adopt recommendations and different wording. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Love day, please. Can you switch your camera off now, Rob? Thank you. Yeah, um, just a question and and a comment. Um, the comment is that we did say that we would get a report on all on a year's worth of data for the adult social care to review at the July meeting. Um, now, obviously, that will be new a new committee as such, so it might not be reasonable to actually make a lot of recommendations from that, but to refer it to the working party to look at if they decide to reconstitute the working party. However, I do think we need to have a report from adult social care for the year um, to see what's what's changed, which is what they actually promised us, I believe, early. So uh, um, they should be expecting to be asked for a report in July for the previous year's data. Um, so I think we need to hold to that because otherwise it will be a long time. The working party will will only get the data when they reconstitute. If you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, the the other point is um, about the procedure before we get to July the July meeting um, and constitutionally what the status is of the independent members in the meantime. They're presumably advisory and no decisions can be made in that meantime but would it be um, you know, prudent maybe to um, send out for advice to the independent members anything that's coming in from the committee of standards and public life so they're aware of it before the July meeting and the, uh, the other point on that is is there anything to stop us if, if everything's been sorted out with political balancing, et cetera, et cetera, having a brief um, meeting to just reconstitute the Standards Committee before the July meeting so that we do have the council members in place as well? Because I take Rob's point about things might, the consultation of things might be happening in that period. Yeah. Um, with regards to the uh, continuation of the independent um, members and the town and parish representatives that are uh, re-elected um, or, or stay on, the independent members will remain members of the Standards Committee. Clearly, they have no decision making powers um, at the moment, but they, if something came up, we would, of course, consult with them. And the town and parish representatives that 
are, are appointed as individuals. They're not appointed by their own um, town or parishes. So their um, place on the committee carries on, providing that they, they are re-elected. With regards to a sort of informal, unconstituted meeting of the committee, the issue with that is that you, you wouldn't have a chair because you need the formal meeting to then uh, appoint the chair and carry on. However, once the members of the Standards Committee have been appointed and political balancing was achieved, if we were in a position where we needed to do some form of consultation, then I would be advising those members in advance of the July meeting of the current situation with regards to anything the government was, was planning. Makes sense. My point, my point, Simon, really was if all the political balancing has been sorted out and the uh, the proposals for me council members of the Standards Committee are done by June, is there any reason why we can't timetable in a, a short constituting the Standards Committee meeting? Um, <laughs> Uh, you, 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 we would have to ask Mel if we could have an extraordinary meeting, if, if, if one was required. But oh, yeah. I think if, if, if it was a time sensitive issue, as it was for the code of conduct in March and the need to get that through, I, I, you know, I, I would certainly be more than happy to approach Mel on behalf of the members to say, you know, they're, 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 I believe there is a need for this. Yeah, that, that was what I sort of flagged. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gammon, please. Jackie. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Simon, on the engage, the proposed engagement with NALC, <coughs> excuse me, um, I would like to to um, ask that particular uh, that attention is paid to in, in that consultation in some way um, on bullying uh, of town and parish clerks and officers because um, it does concern me deeply that, that town and parish officers and town clerks are out there on a limb a lot of the time and are prey to elected members with an agenda without protection. And we're talking about uh, decisions that can be made that can destroy professionals' careers uh, and lives uh, and it needs looking at. Um, I, I can say that um, the biggest concern is that the, the bullying of clerks by one or two members in town, in, in the towns, and particularly in the smaller parishes, um, it is something that will be the focus. It will be a focus of bullying of um, members by members of the public, and also then the bullying of clerks and other officers by members and members of the public. There have been several instances of bullying clerks by members of the public recently. Um, which I'm aware of, but it, it, it is all it will all be within within the mix um, of to, to consider going forwards. Thank you for that. And I think it's also important to remember that uh, obviously clerks are employees of the councils of the individual councils. Uh, they don't come under the remit of Cornwall Council. Uh, they are uh, employed, as it were, uh, by each separate parish and town council. But there is an issue there, Jackie. You're absolutely right. And it is something that uh, that we will look at. Any other questions, please? Yes, Sue, you want to come back, I think. Sue, uh, sorry, Sue, Sue Nicholas. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, just coming back to the bullying of clerks and things, it's really down to the chairman of the parish council to actually take some action and actually, you know, not allow that. Um, certainly, in my role as chair of the parish council, I would not allow that to happen to a clerk. And I think it it kind of like comes back, doesn't it, to what we've been saying about the training of those that come into parish and town councils and uh, the clerks. Uh, I mean, we appointed a new clerk last November who's absolutely brilliant and doing all sorts of training and things. But it is down to how we train or how new councillors um, are trained. Uh, I know certainly planning training is the one thing that um, our councillors are, are keen to do. So I do think we need to, certainly I intend to put in some kind of training thing so that councillors do get that opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Tony Woodham's next, please. Tony, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, just a quick one on the uh, Code of Conduct. Uh, yesterday, um, Sarah Mason sent out an email to all town and parish uh, councils. Uh, she still has issues with the uh, Code of Conduct um, as, as published. And um, what she said, 
particularly is the training requirement declarations of gifts and hospitality, authority for actions on individual members and some numbering issues. And also the issues that we discussed briefly about um, whether things in that code are relevant to town and parish councils. We, we were just about to uh, make a recommendation to our, our council that this was accepted um, by the parish as the code of conduct. But the advice that we've got now is to defer that decision until these questions are answered. Um, I'm assuming that Simon already has a copy of that email, but if he doesn't, I can make one available to him. Yes, and unfortunately, um, Sarah was on leave when I sent out the code of conduct. I did send it to her in advance of it going out to the towns and parishes. Um, I have replied to Sarah, but with regards to the code of conduct, it is for the towns and parishes to consider if they want to adopt or adapt in certain areas for, for their own uses. There is some terminology within there that would relate to Cornwall Council. The reason we send out the Cornwall code is when I do the training, I would do it on the Cornwall code, but then I will explain the differences that may exist with the town and parish codes. For instance, there is one area where said that members must have regard to the advice of the financial officer or the monitoring officer, whereas it's referred to as the proper officer in the, uh, um, the, the town and parish code. Um, there are other issues in there where I think there's been a miscommunication um, with regards to um, matters such as the de declaration of gifts and hospitality as the standards committee adopted the wording that was recommended by the committee on standards in public life as was so that that should sit now that all gifts should be declared towns and parishes could adapt to their own financial threshold though yep thank you thank thank you for that um uh, two two points that, that come from that um Many parish and town uh, councils would have discussed the two options, the NARC recommendation and the Cornwall Council one. And certainly in our council, that's come forward as an agenda item. And we're still waiting um, for the response from CULP before we make a decision on which one we adopt. Uh, clearly, it would be beneficial if town and parishes adopt the Cornwall one because for administration, it makes it a lot, lot simpler. Um, but until those points are answered, I mean, we won't be making any decision on that. Um, and we are moving now, as you discussed earlier, uh, we're coming off of virtual meetings until the legislation is passed. Um, hopefully that we can go back uh, past the 7th of May and have uh, actual meetings rather than virtual meetings where we can give this a proper airing. But up to that point, we can't do that. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, Councillor Gammon, please, Jackie. Yeah, sorry, Chair, I want to come back on what I was talking about. Um, I take on board all that you say about clerks and officers being employed by the town and parish and Sue saying about the chair and training. Some people you can train as much as you want and they will interpret the training to their own, to suit their own needs. So the, the, the clerks and officers need and I am hoping I've been in talking to someone from NOLC that is involved with this um, this um, inquiry going forward um, and I'm pleased to see that it is coming forward but I can't stress enough that town and parish clerks whether they are employed by the town council or not someone needs to put protection in for them because there is little or no protection for them at the moment and sometimes it is the chair of the parish or town clerk that isn't stopping the bullying and the persecution because they are involved and it isn't fair when we're talking about people's careers lives and mental health that is being affected thank you jackie uh, those, those comments have been noted thank you councillor jenkin please Yeah, it was just on the um, uh, code of conduct for parish and town councils. I mean, I, I, I remember previously when we adapted things, we had a meeting with the, with Calc and, and ironed out any differences for the parishes. And I think, as Simon says, maybe it's a matter of, of communication that 
you know, the, the code is written as for Cornwall Council and there are a couple of things that need to be maybe adapted, like the requirement for training for parishes in some way um, and, um, and gifts. And obviously, you know, in this period of elections, it's difficult for, for chairs and vice chairs to have a meeting, but I wonder if the officers could um, meet and actually just come up with a common code for the parish and town councils for Cornwall because yeah. otherwise we could get lots of different town and parishes adapting things slightly differently which will make it more difficult to administer. Um, if I could Mr Chairman, Sarah Mason is, is uh, listening online, hello Sarah, um, and she's emailed me and messaged on Teams as well. Um, she has said that she will be updating the parishes today after my email, this is the email I sent her first thing this morning about the Cornwall Code. So they adopt the Cornwall version and they will continue to promote a single version for Cornwall. And one of the things I have said in Sarah Loveday, going back to the point you've just made, is that there, there will be a need to try to look at a code of conduct that suits all levels of local government in Cornwall going forwards. Uh, the idea of the committee and standards in public life was eventually all councils would adopt the Cornwall Council code. Now clearly the wording suits Cornwall Council and maybe not towns and parishes so much. But there will perhaps there's some work there to do in the future to try and adapt the wording so it suits all levels. I think that will be very helpful because we don't want lots of different um, minor adaptations because that's going to make it even more difficult to administer. So yeah. if we can all get together and, and make sure that we've got the different level wording in the overall code, that would yes. be good. OK, lovely. Thank you very much for that uh, love day. Anybody else, please? Can't see anybody else putting anything in the box. So the recommendation is that the uh, work plan for the Standards Committee for 2021. Oh, hang on, Rob. Yes, come on, Rob. Rob Bishop. Thanks, Mr Chair. Just a, a suggestion, Simon. You said you would uh, record the, um, the one of the meetings for the online training. Can I suggest you do a couple? Because as sure as eggs are eggs, one will go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the vote of confidence, Rob. Uh, but yes, we will, we will try to do a couple. <laughs> OK, it so the record won't go wrong with you. It'll be somebody in the audience, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the recommendation is the work plan for the Standards Committee for 2021 to June 2022 as set out in the appendix be approved, subject to any amendments the Standards Committee wish to make. I'm quite happy to propose that recommendation. Again, I asked my Vice Chair if she's happy to second. Yeah, ha happy to second it with the proviso that there's a report from Adult Social Care to the July meeting. Yep, that's been noted. That, I believe, has been noted. Debbie, the vote, please. Thank you, Chairman. So the recommendation has been moved by Councillor Wills and seconded by Councillor Jenkin that the work programme for the Standards Committee for 2021 to June 2022, as set out in Appendix A, be approved, taking account of the points raised at today's meeting. If I could go to the vote again, a roll call. Councillor Alvey. Four. Councillor Frank. Four. Councillor Gammon. Four. Councillor Jenkin. Four. Councillor Nicholas. Four. Councillor Pugh. Four. And Councillor Wills. Four. Thank you, members. Chairman, the recommendation has been approved. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item eight on the agenda, which is the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman Decision Report and Cornwall Council's response. Reference number 19019385, which is pages 65 to 81 in your agenda packs. Uh, to present this report, uh, we have the Service Director, Service Design Improvement and Resources, uh, Keith Cheeseman. Keith, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the committee. Um, I'll ask you to present the report, please. And I hope I got your title correct. I think it varies, Chairman, so I, I, I'll, I'll live with it. It's service director and everything else is, is up, up for play, but I certainly work for uh, the adult social care. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to run you through. I'm not going to uh, present anything. I'm, I'm going to assume that you've got the paperwork and I'll, I'll deal with that accordingly. Um, Cornwall Council has a duty to consider a local government and social care ombudsman uh, decision report. 
subsequent council response uh, at a formal committee meeting and in this instance the standards committee so i'm here to help you uh, in your consideration of the findings uh, surrounding a complaint made to the lgseo by mr x uh, who made a case that the council had failed to assess his finances correctly uh, the ombudsman published a report uh, of the investigation uh, into that complaint uh, on the 2nd of march this year the case centres on, on the treatment of occupational pension monies uh, paid into a joint account and the effect of that treatment on Mr X's uh, capital position and the impact on the calculation of his self-funding threshold. The, finding, well, the findings were that the council was at fault uh, because it failed to disregard half uh, of Mr X's occupational pensions uh, when doing its self-funding calculation and secondly that it sought to restrict uh, his expenditure to the personal expenses allowance uh, when he was paying for his own care in terms of that the the council has agreed uh, we we uh, accept that we are at fault uh, in that regard um, and within the four weeks uh, required uh, we have written to uh, mrs x and mr y uh, mr x has subsequently passed away uh, we have apologised for the failings. Uh, we have uh, paid uh, £6,941 to reinstate the uh, estate value uh, to the uh, normal threshold of £23,250. Um, and we've also paid uh, Mr Y, uh, Mr X's son, uh, £250 for the time and trouble uh, it, that he's gone through uh, in pursuing the complaint. Uh, it may not be possible for the council to comply with a recommendation relating to assessments already undertaking, un undertaken. Sorry, uh, the council has already raised the matter with the ombudsman, um, who is concerned that the potential injustice uh, to those that we have treated in this way it could be significant, um, and they have urged the council to reconsider the position. Um, so perhaps I can take you through some of the background. Um, care and support statutory guidance uh, states where a person is in a care home and has a spouse or civil partner who is not living in the same care home and is paying half of the value of their occupational pension personal pension or retirement annuity to their spouse or civil partner the local authority must disregard this payment mr x had been self-funding his care but approached the council for financial assistance as his funds approached the threshold Mr X had an occupational pension uh, paid into a bank account held jointly with his wife. When count calculating when Mr X would qualify for found funding, the council did not disregard 50% of that pension on the basis that the act of payment into the of, of a pension into a joint account did not by itself provide evidence of an intention for half to be paid to the partner. As a result of not disregarding 50% of the pension, uh, the council told Mr X that they had calculated that he should be able to self-fund his care for longer. The LGO, however, says that the act of paying money into a joint account is, in itself, evidence of paying half the money to a spouse or civil partner, provided there is evidence that the money is being used for the maintenance of that person, as there was in this case. The failure to disregard half of Mr X's uh, occupational pensions when doing the self-calculation was the fault. Uh, by the council. So we have responded. We've um, we've looked through this one clearly. Uh, no amendment was needed to a policy because there is no there was nothing in the policy about the treatment of uh, private and or occupational pensions. We have though uh, issued guidance to staff uh, stating when an occupational pension is in payment to a service user, we must ask if that service user's intention for their partner to have fifty percent. Uh, of their pension, and if it is, we will disregard it. This discussion must be recorded in the normal way in the uh, routine case recording. We will advise uh, that it may be beneficial to the service user if half of the pension income was then transferred into a separate account of the spouse. We won't insist that they do that, but we will advise that if the funds remained in the sole or uh, account the service user then we will be using the whole um, and if in the joint 50% of the said balances as capital. The LGO has queried this 
uh, saying it looks like we will not be disregarding 50% of the pension income. We will be, and we're trying to make this in really clear through the process that if the income is paid in and 50% is not paid out, this will cause the capital balance to increase, which could impact on funding assistance. As I said, we have apologised uh, to Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Y and Mrs. X, uh, that we, and we've made the payments. Uh, there's a further recommendation by the LGO, which is that the that they recommend the council within three months of the original report, which is the 16th of February, um, takes action to make sure it disregards the 50% of occupational pensions when they're being paid to a spouse or sort of partner. Um, as I've said, uh, we've issued new guidance and we've provided evidence to the LGO for that. Um, second re further recommendation was that uh, we should take action to ensure that it does not restrict discretionary expenditure of self-funders to the personal expenses allowance and provide evidence that we've done that. Um, we have, we've, we've issued that further guidance um, to help them making decisions on calculating when a, uh, a person should be entitled to funding assistance and how they should consider if deprivation of an asset has occurred. The LGO have been provided with a copy of this document and they've not provided any comments in return. They have also asked us to identify anyone else adversely affected by the current practice within the past 12 months or that previous uh, practice, I should say. Um, and that we would remedy any injustice that may have been caused uh, and provide evidence that we've done that. Now, the Council does not accept this recommendation on the grounds that it would be oppressive. Uh, it would involve manually reviewing 1,211 residential assessments carried out in the last 12 months. Um, and even on a um, conservative estimate, uh, that would take a full time officer more than 32 weeks to, to carry out. So we're, we're not minded to go back through uh, the caseload to do that. Um, so I think before you, you have a, a paper which has two uh, recommendations that the, uh, the response detailed in Appendix 2, um, detailing the recommended actions taken by the Adult Social Care Directorate and the learning arising from local government and social care ombudsman's report to be endorsed. And secondly, uh, a question whether uh, the standards committee consider if the working party set up to review adult social care reports and complaints from the LGSO uh, should take this matter to its work programme, given that you just discussed the work programme. Um, I'll leave that one with you. Uh, very happy to, to take some questions um, or to uh, elaborate in any way. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, very Keith. Much. Um, I've obviously read through the reports. I'm sure all the members have. Would you accept that uh, this was an accounting uh, error, really? Um, in, in the whole, would you accept that that was the case? I think I'm, I think it was um, it was an error of of judgment with an officer at the time. Uh, as I say, there was, there's no policy that was that was um, followed or not followed in, in the case of this. So it was an error of judgment uh, by that officer. No poor intent, just an understanding of the way that uh, we would understand um, that a that a paying money into a joint account does not necessarily um, show intention that it is shared money. Uh, and I think on any premise, I, I don't think that's unreasonable, but we accept that um, th that is the way that uh, it is interpreted and therefore we would have therefore done a, done a totally different treatment of, of that money in bulk that's sitting in the account. So, so yes, I can agree. I, I, I think it is broadly a, you know, it, it, as with so many of things, it is a numbers game, but it, it had consequence to that particular decision. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Nicholas, please, Sue. Just get in there. There we go. Um, yeah, what concerns me from what you've just been saying, I mean, the Ombudsman said that you were to disregard 50% if it was per, put into a joint account, and yet you're saying that um, staff are questioning whether 50% of it is being used or not. Surely it's very clear from the Ombudsman that you disregard 50% of whatever is in that account for the other partner. I find it a bit, um, 
big brotherish that we're actually then asking people to say whether that is being used for that other person or not and um suggesting that they move money into another account you know we're making that very onerous on the person who um as is telling us that they that account is a joint account so why would we be questioning it when certainly the way that i read the ombudsman is saying that you disregard 50 percent in a joint account so I'd, i so i would start with with just the premise that we also have a duty to understand whether somebody is depleting their funds um inappropriately uh, so it, we we have a constant regard to, to the kind of the money that sit there um I, you know and i i think this is an awkward balance I, I completely accept this is a very awkward balance of of um trying to intervene um or not trying to intervene and the balance as you say it, it can feel a, a bit big brotherish but mm. We, you know, we, we're a public body. We have a responsibility to make sure that people use their funds appropriately in the in the in the in the scheme of overall in terms of reasonable expenditure that may deplete a capital position that does or doesn't put them into a um, kind of into the threshold of um, having kind of support from from the council. Um, so I think we have with good intention suggested that actually if they take the money out and, and, and make clear it's positivity about the intention to provide half of the pension to spouse or civil partner. It's not so much that we're we're trying to kind of bend around the bit where we just make it easier just to kind of track the money. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a positive uh, distinction that's being made there. Um, I, mean, I, I, I can bring my colleague uh, Kerry in who, who manages the team if, uh, if you want to kind of explore that in more detail but I, I, I think it's um, it's not so much our, our um, wanting to control as to, to make sure that we're, we are clear. I think it'd be interesting. Sorry, 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 Sue. Sue, I think it'd be interesting just to hear from Kerry uh, at the moment if that's okay. Yeah, um, no, that's Kerry, Kerry can pick up on that point and then you can come back. Kerry. Hello. Um, I think really when you're talking about disregarding a pension, the reason, uh, the intentions behind it is that we should ask the service user if it is their intention to leave 50% of their pension at home. We cannot just assume and that, you know, under the Care Act regulations, uh, we must never assume that that is their intention. So now we must always ask. So just leaving it there is not, it is incorrect for us to do that. So we, we we must state that intention, and that's what we've 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 kind of tried to be quite clear with the ombudsman that that's what we're doing now. Um, and the act of what we've asked about them transferring fifty percent of that pension for their spouse and partner to another account is is for the benefit of the service user. To be quite honest, because if um, they we, we disregarded fifty percent, it remained in that account that was a joint account or a sole account of the service user. And it remained unspent by the spouse, um, their capital would increase and therefore at a, at a time we review annually, if they were above capital threshold again, they would they would have a period where they may become self-funding again. So we're actually trying to help them so that the spouse actually does benefit mm. from that intention. I think that's, that's the catch 22, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, if the money accumulates 50% of the partners, then that's surely what that partner wants to spend that on, not necessarily what the um, individual who's being cared for spends it on. I mean, for instance, you know, if I have to, I've got a joint accounts with with my partner and I don't expect somebody if he has to have nursing care or if I have to have nursing care, I don't expect somebody to start asking me why, what is the other money being spent on? We're you know, I think that's... That Councillor Nicholas, we're not asking that at all. We're well, that sounds saying... like what you're asking. No, it no, sounds no. like you're asking them to define what is the other half is going to be spent on. Not at all, not at all. It's just that if it remains in that account and if they had an annual review and it took them above the threshold, we'd have to include, if it was a joint account, 50% of those funds as belonging to the service user. I don't think that's what the ombudsman says very clearly, but I, yeah, we'll we'll agree to differ. But I certainly wouldn't agree with that one because it sounds to me like the ombuds is saying 50% stays for the partner. 
Oh yes, and that that is what we're doing. We are. We're at. If their intention is to leave fifty percent of of their income, so we're not talking about what's left for capital, the income, then yeah. we will disregard that from the financial assessment. That's exactly yeah. that's exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I think what 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 Kerry is, the point they're trying to make here. Um, is is about the threshold and whether or not keeping money in the account will take them over that threshold and they then have to go back into self-funding um, and rather than see that situation develop it's better to be clear and transparent where that money um, is going it's going to uh, their other their their partner um, to support them um, and it's about that threshold which is it's difficult I know but it, it, it it's one of those things that uh, that obviously the team have to look at councillor jenkins lovely yeah so i agree with next. i agree with sue on this this is a whole can of worms um because it smacks of big brother saying right we're going to check that you're actually spending the money in the way that you want it to if you have to set up a separate account i also think at the time when people are looking at longer term care and how they're going to fund it to expect people to then start moving money around into different bank accounts and things doesn't make a lot of sense and just puts extra stress on the family at that time so i do think there is something that isn't being seen here surely there is a way of looking at um previous trends you know, if the money goes in and is spent in a normal way over you know the last year or whatever, it, it's it's how it's being used. And the majority of older people do have a joint account for their daily living expenses. And to actually say that's not the right way to do it is 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 an anathema, I would say, to the majority of older people. Um, you know, those of us who are maybe a bit younger might be saying, well, it's my money, I'm keeping it to myself. But that's not how people function as a partnership quite often um and to sort of be saying right well that means that we need to you need to set up a separate account to put in um you know the pension pot when the pension pot is being used to pay living expenses i think is unreasonable and and i think we need to find another way of doing it and maybe that's something that the working party can look into and look in a bit more detail at how how these financial assessments are made i think there is a cultural thing here that we need to be understanding better okay do you want to come back on that keith are you um i think all i would say is i i don't think we're doing anything that most authorities don't do in this regard you know the, as i say there is a certain expectation on us that we're we're you know, understanding capital depletion and, um, you know, and and the finances of of a of a couple or an individual, um, uh, they're not simple. And 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 frankly, the 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 ask of uh, offices in a relatively short conversation um, and you know with with pressure on all the rest of it uh, to to make, you know, complex judgments um, very quickly and very simply. Um, is tricky and and you know clearly already with the commentary this morning i you know i get it it's um it's potentially emotive and it's potentially um you know sort of um divisive um but i i, I think what we've put in place uh is a sensible uh, step in terms of of advice it doesn't have to be followed and we will you know as Kerry has said you know, we take no regard of that 50% once it's carved out, as long as it is positively um, um, expressed, you know, expressed as a uh, as an intention to, to kind of pass that money across. Thank you. Tony Woodhams, please. Tony. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, it, it, interesting to listen to some of the comments, but it's not the function of any government or any policy or local government or central government to determine how money is spent, personal money is spent, that's up to the individual. And I don't think we should be getting involved too much in that. The Looking at going back to the report, the legislation that led to the Ombudsman's finding, uh, that was extent at the time, extent rather, at the time this incident in question was determined. And it led to a finding of fault resulting in injustice. And that's purely, without going to anything else, that's purely on the self-funding calculation. 
Now, I note further in the body of the report that there are potentially 2,423 other files uh, of individuals within the duchy that could potentially be affected by this miscalculation on self-funding uh, calculation. Um, it just occurs to me, how on earth will they know of the Ombudsman's uh, judgment of injustice in this particular case if there's not a letter at the very least sent to all those people on that file to say that they have the option of a review should they deter or should they feel that there might be a, um, a case for injustice on their particular cases. It just seems that the, the Ombudsman have, has found out exactly what has gone wrong with that. He's made his recommendations and I think as an authority you're duty bound now to follow that recommendation up. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Keith, please. So I, 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 I'm a little troubled by that. And, and the reason I say that, and, and, and I, you know, I, this is uh, uh, awkward territory, but I, I would say that actually it is uh, it is actually very easy uh, for people to make a complaint and to to follow through to um, the ombudsman. So I, I think you know if if there were such a body of people that that felt like we had um, unreasonably and unfairly treated them in that process, they uh, there are very very low low hurdles here to to kind of go through to get through to that to that level of a complaint and it's and it's you know the the door is there at any anybody uh, making uh, representation to the council they feel aggrieved will have that pointed out to them so it, there's uh, you know uh, there's a fine balance here as I say we you know we we have scarce resource to to put somebody um, on the case of looking for um, you know, Lara. 30 weeks worth of work to kind of go through and, and, to, and to find the potential for the error to have occurred more than once. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think it is a balance and, you know, I'm clearly I will be instructed by, um, you know, members on this, but I, I, I personally think it would be uh, challenging to uh, to go through that as a, as a, as a process. Um, the point about kind of whether we would uh, write to people uh, to express that, I think uh, personally, again, I think there is uh, more than adequate access to the knowledge and understanding of of complaint like this. Again, I, you know, if, if the committee um, directs in that way, then you know, clearly, I I will take instruction on that on that matter. But I I I don't particularly support the view that we will find large numbers of these cases in the files like this. I think you know it's a relatively um, specific instance. Okay, Tony, do you want to come back? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I accept I accept the premise that's just been put forward, but on the, by the same token, it's it's been identified that there could have been a possible injustice. The ombudsman has determined that there was an injustice, and that. That is the view, and that's that's what, as a committee and as an authority, we've decided that if, if we can't resolve it internally, it goes to that for an independent statement. We can't then cherry pick the bits that we want to do and what we don't want to do. It just seems to me that if that is the opinion of the Ombudsman after due deliberation, that that's at the very least what we should be looking to enact. OK, thank you for that. That's interesting. And I think members will come back uh, to that point uh, throughout the course of the debate. Tony, uh, Professor Dean is next, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have an observation and a substantive point, but I should start off by saying that I wholly endorse what Tony Woodhams has just said, and I'm not getting a sense that um, uh, you know, that the Ombudsman's um, report is being taken on board at all. Um, I, my observation is this, in relation to the first um, action that had to be taken off in the three month period, uh, it says that the occupational pension guidance was sent. I presume that's by email. Um, and then it says this demonstrates uh, that the training uh, has been provided. I don't think the sending of an email uh, is uh, 
training. Um, and clearly, if you can identify a short bit of face to face to bring this to the attention of uh, whoever in the department, then I think that would be good. Uh, the same applies for the second action point. It says it was sent, I'm assuming again, an email. Not that there's anything wrong with emails, that's absolutely fine. But in relation to something like this, I think it needs a little bit more than just circulating the existing guidance or new guidance. So that's just simply my observation. Um, in relation to the recommendation uh, about the 12 month period, I repeat, I totally endorse what Tony Woodhams has said. Um, the idea that somebody sat down and calculated that it would cost however much uh, to do this is almost irrelevant. Uh, this is, you know, potentially a windrush moment for the council. Could be, it might not be. But what I would say that it seems that the issue is cost, not justice. And the idea that anybody could contact the council um, to say that they want to uh, a, a review, um, I agree, they don't know that there's an issue. Um, it's farcical that, you know, I'm sitting here and I might think, oh, let, hang on a minute, there could be something wrong here. I'm not monitoring the council's committees or, or ombudsman's reports. Um, and I think that the idea that somehow, you know, we're not going to do what the ombudsman asks um, it, it is wrong and that we should find a way of doing it. Um, I think Mr Cheeseman said that it was one particular officer. Well, it may not be. We don't know. I mean, it was in that case. Um, and, you know, to say that you're not minded or you may not or there are issues um, when something as serious as this has taken place, uh, I find very troubling um, and that uh, to ignore uh, what the Ombudsman has said should happen, uh, I think is very dangerous ground. I accept that we have limited funds. I accept that it would cost, but there have to be ways and means of dealing with this. And at the moment, I'm not hearing any sense that uh, the recommendation is being taken on board in a serious way. And this is the lives of people um, who, you know, are not suddenly, you know, uh, going to wake up one morning and think I must ask for a review. Um, they are probably in very complex and difficult situations. It's incumbent on the council to do something rather than sit back and say, oh, it might cost a bit much. Um, it's the lives of people. I mean, you've identified uh, 2,423 files. Um, well, that's a lot of people who could actually be adversely affected. I hope that that isn't the case, and it may well be that there are very few cases. But you could start by looking at all the cases that that one particular officer uh, decided. That's one way. The other way is to go for random sampling. But I simply do not accept that the council can sit back and ignore what the ombudsman said. Thank you very much for that, Professor Dean. Do you wish to come back on that, Keith? Um, so if I can just um, maybe assure you, uh, first of all, that the uh, your opening about um, uh, an email piece, uh, we've actually done uh, briefings. So as part of um, kind of staff interactions, managers with teams, etc. So so it has been okay. briefed and, uh, you know, an opportunity to discuss. So it, it, it certainly wasn't just a kind of a, a distribution. Thank uh, you for that reassurance. Thank you. And, and it's been followed up in writing. Clearly, that allows us to, to kind of uh, point back to, to, to the written word as well. Um, I mean, I, I, t I take on board your commentary. I, I, I absolutely do. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not taking this lightly, and I, and I, um, I do need to kind of, um, I guess, uh, take under advisement what, where to go next. I, as I, I, I do, um, I do strongly feel that with the, the, the kind of the particular instance and the level of diligence of of the team at the front line doing this work that you know I think we would know that there would be a a, a potential um, sort of number of these here I, I will talk to the team again and 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 kind of work that through I, I, I genuinely think it will be a relatively no, low number and part of what we are dealing with uh, in the middle of this is the lack of 
uh, absolute clarity in, in kind of determining kind of what exactly uh, the, the trigger points are in here. It, it, there are quite a number of very vague statements and our, we have no responsibility whatsoever to do kind of, you know, the, the, the self um, checking or self assessment pieces, but we do that in order to try and provide information. So, we, you know, we, we go further than we are required to do to, to, to put up you know, information in the service users' hands at the time we go through this. So, you know, it, it, it's not, we are not, you know, we, and I'll say this very, very, very clearly, you know, nobody goes to work to do a bad job. Nobody, nobody in that team goes out to go and get as much as they can. We, we routinely take decisions, I believe, that are um, sided towards benefit to the service user rather than than council and we and we do that in uh, you know day in and day out so i, I you know I, I we advise at the time of the conversation that you know if you want to know more you want to understand better if you're not happy you know come back and talk to us and we'll we'll go back through it again so I, you know at the time of the interaction when when that interaction is freshest and you know people are uh, working through and understand whether or not they they feel like it's um uh, appropriate or, or you know, whether they feel um, hard done by or, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of language which doesn't kind of scoot across the fact that this is, you know, sort of really impactful for people's lives, but they've had the opportunity, they understand at the time we're going through this and they are offered, you know, as, as I say, more support uh, should they should they want it at the time. So I, I, you know, I, I genuinely would be surprised if we, if we were to go through that exercise and, and would find, you know, significantly a number of cases in that, in that group. You wish to come back, Professor Dean? Well, as I said, I'm not hearing that the Ombudsman report has been taken on board. You know, I'm not suggesting people go to work to deliberately, you know, do down others, but as, as, Tony Woodham said, this is a recommendation of the Ombudsman uh, and whoever came up with the idea that, you know, the, the, the individuals must come to the council. I'm sure once they get to that point, um, then, you know, it would be dealt with sympathetically. But that's not the point. Uh, and the idea that, that you're convinced that actually there aren't any other cases or very few, uh, you know, with the greatest of respect is irrelevant because um, the Ombudsman has made a recommendation on the basis of this case and yes it will be resource heavy um, but there may be other ways of dealing with it and to completely ignore that recommendation I think is wrong, it's wrong in principle um, and that a way through it should be found and were I to have voting rights in this uh, I would simply not endorse this at all because I think it, it raises more, more issues than it settles. And it's very troubling that, that what I'm seeing is, is an unwillingness to take on what's been said um, uh, by the Ombudsman. Uh, and that, as I say, it's down to cost, not justice. And if you did go through that exercise, maybe you would find a lot, maybe you wouldn't. But the point is, the Ombudsman has recommended it on the basis of, uh, you know, an in-depth analysis of that case. Um, so not to take on board what they're asking is, is a dangerous route to go, I feel. OK, thank you. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to that when we come to the recommendations. Uh, Sue, Sue Nicholas next, please. Hi, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I would endorse everything that Professor Dean and Tony Woodhams has said. Um, I don't get that emotional. I've been nursing for 50 odd years and there are times when I don't, you know, there are things that you have to do whether you like it or not. But, you know, we've heard about how much it's going to cost in time of officers time and, and things like that and, and to the council. But this funding, you know, it's the livelihood of individuals, residents that we look after. And, you know, that impact may be just as great on them as it is on the council. So I'm sorry, but I don't agree that, you know, because it's going to cost something, uh, we don't review these cases. And I personally think that the cases should be reviewed 
and looked at. And if we don't find a great number of them, then fair enough. But otherwise, you know, even if it brings some money to maybe a few, it's it's better than not at all. And it's, you know, it's all very well. I, I often get phone calls from people around the county um, who don't understand why their partners are in care homes, why they're being funded by the NHS one minute and then suddenly they're being told they've got to pay it because that's not agreed. Um, they don't understand assessments, you know, and I end up having to write to our um, senior um, adult social care officers about it. And, you know, when older people go into care homes or anybody who goes into a care home, it's a traumatic experience for that individual and their partners. And it's a time when, you know, as, as um, Professor Dina said, you know, they're not thinking about how the finance is going to go, what their bank accounts are, how much they're going to spend on it. So I do think that the reviews should be done. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. Councillor Jenkins, please. Love day. Yes, um, without being emotive about it, it may well be this is the only case, but it might not be if we don't know. And if we look at what the um, LGSCO has said, it, they're only asking us to go back 12 months. They could have asked us to go back more than that. Um, looking at um, current practices within the past 12 months um, we, and providing evidence that the council have done that. Now, it, it does surprise me that the only way to do that is through a manual reassessment of everything. I would have thought we were at the stage where we would be able to um, have all this information within a software systems where you could actually use algorithms to to flash up the cases to look at in more detail. But uh, maybe that's something to do with systems that needs to be looked at for the for the future, um, because it does concern me that we're talking about the fact that this would have to be done manually for the whole of the cases because we can't pull out ones where where they need to be looked at in more detail. But I do agree that we do need to do that, whether it's about the only other alternative to that is to actually um, provide, as Tony was saying, the letter out saying, if you think you need a review, please let us know, um, which might be a way of um, pulling out those that are the most concerned to start with. Um, and maybe that's a halfway house to just sitting down and going through all of them. but. I don't think we can disregard the local government ombudsman's view on this. It's something that it's quite clear. They're saying, look at the last 12 months, remedy any injustice and provide evidence that you've done so. I don't think we can turn around and say that's oppressive and we can't do it because it's going to cost us too much. Um, I think we have to find a solution and a way of doing what the local government ombudsman is suggesting, maybe in a slightly different way from what they're suggesting. But and as I say, maybe that letter to all service users is a is a shortcut that might be possible to pick out anyone who's concerned. Um, and then they would be able to, you know, get you started on on the ones that um, are of concern rather than having to go through everything. But I don't think you can just ignore it and say, well, we can't do it. Uh, got a few now that wish to speak. Sally Vincent, next, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Clearly much has already been said, so I will be very brief. Um, but with all due respect to Mr Cheeseman, I, I'm hearing excuses and not solutions. And I don't think that's right. Something's clearly gone wrong. Um, and I think that this must be a black and white situation. The Ombudsman has made a recommendation. I think that Cornwall Council must follow that recommendation. People have been disadvantaged um, when they're in a very sensitive time in their lives. Um, so I think that all those cases should be reviewed. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Uh, Councillor Frank, next please. Hilary. 
thank you. Um, a lot of what uh, Professor Dean said I found on, resonated with me, and I think one of the phrases was it should be about justice, not cost, and that's particularly, um, I found particularly resonated with me. Um, but also I picked up on Councillor Jenkins' proposal um, of sending out a letter to all service users saying please contact us, explaining the background, saying please contact us if you think you might have been um, disadvantaged by this. I think that at least would be one step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Frank. Uh, Councillor Elvey, please, Martin. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm not going to say a great deal because I, I'm um, agreeing really with what others have already said, other than to point out that really for us to ignore the recommendation of the Ombudsman um, will do terrible reputational damage to the Council. This, you know, this is a something that is in the, the public domain, um, the findings of the Ombudsman, um, as indeed are our discussions today, um, and for us to ignore it, um, I think it would badly damage the reputation of the Council and, and our job as as members is to um, protect the reputation of the Council by, by doing the right thing. Okay, thank you. Keith, do you wish to uh, sum up? So, uh, thank you, Chair. I, I think um, just picking up on the, the, the question about system, um, uh, yes, we've looked at that, but it, it, uh, it is not as easy as it as it sounds. The, the algorithm approach would be uh, overly complex and not that secure, so we, we would end up with a manual process. Um, that is a, um, a factor within what the modernization program that I'm kind of bringing together and, and moving forward at the moment uh, is trying to pick up and address. So, uh, you know, that's that's a jam tomorrow uh, promise. I, I completely get that, but it is something that we have in hand and that does concern me that we are not as, as able to extract from systems the data that we would want uh, as cleanly as we would wish. Um, so uh, that is an ongoing piece that I, uh, I will be picking up. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't want to diminish the, the feelings of the committee. I, I, I'm, I'm hearing it, it's very loud and clear. Um, I, I, would, I would say uh, we, we took legal advice to get to the position that we got to. That's just advice. Um, I, as I say, I, I hear the, the call. Um, I, it, it feels like uh, what we will do or will need to do is, uh, is the letter. Uh, a letter out to the, to the service users that we are, uh, can identify, um, and it, it, you know it, if that's if that is effectively the will of the of the committee and the recommendation that standards committee in order to to kind of deal with the process uh, is, then I'm I'm happy to to take that as an action to um, just get the ball rolling on that. Um, I, I would say just uh, it may not add very many crumbs of comf comfort, and I and I I. I uh, really am not trying to diminish the, the potential in, uh, impact uh, on some people uh, through this. Um, but actually, the vast majority of people that we work through this process with um, are actually the representatives of the of the elderly people that are potentially kind of moving into that into that care space. So we're not we're not talking about kind of necessarily kind of you know older people. Uh, having to work it all through for themselves, they are most often represented, um, which m most of the time leads us to kind of uh, 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 what can probably be termed as a fair outcome, even if not one that we would all enjoy. Um, but I, I take on board uh, all of the views. Uh, I am not dismissive at all of the uh, uh, of the impact and. Uh, or of the injustice that, that has been uh, documented in this case and that may be there for others. So uh, we will pick up that um, that letter out and and I presume uh, at some point report back to you in terms of how far uh, that has taken us and, and uh, you know what the outcomes are. Do you consider that um, perhaps uh, a review of all the uh, reviews conducted by the case officer concerned could also be uh, a, a way of um, dealing with some of the concerns raised by the committee? Um, I, I hear that as an ask. I, my suspicion is that 
and, and it's just a suspicion, so I'm very happy to kind of take it further and and uh, and talk through with Kerry and her team. Um, my view would be, my suspicion is that um, because because there was no process breach, there was no policy uh, breach in this case. Um, it may not be as simple as as looking back on that on that kind of one officer, uh, which is why we have the hesitation in the first place about the, the kind of the quantum of of uh, review that's necessary. Uh, so very happy to to kind of to have, as I say extend that conversation slightly, but um, I think the letter probably takes us to a place which is more realistically getting us to uh, the, um, the the actual size of the problem with her as well. Okay, I'm going to read back in uh, Professor Dean. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think, uh, again, it's excuses and explanations rather than action. So what I'm I'm wondering is that um, uh, you can't go for the individual officer and I can see that actually, you know, that's fine. But in addition to the letter, could you go back on uh, the suggestion I made initially, which was to do a random sample on top so that you, you've got those two elements, you've got the letter that goes out, um, there may be people who can't or are unable to reply, whatever, um, but uh, a random sample in addition to the letter, I, I would hope you would be able to do. Um, and then uh, secondly, Chairman, um, in view, I think the, the shared feelings on this, um, I'm wondering if we could have a report back at the uh, next meeting uh, to understand what actions have been taken and uh, what has been found. Chairman, I'm happy, happy to propose those proposals from uh, Professor Dean. If uh, I'm just writing down something now actually uh, uh, on our recommendations. So uh, I'll just ask Keith if he wishes to pick up on the points there that Professor Dean uh, mentioned. Uh, very happy to pick up the random sample uh, piece. I, yeah, more than happy with that. Um, and as I say, already expecting and happy to, to kind of bring back a, a progress report. Okay, uh, random sample of how many percent? Because bearing in mind you've got two and a half thousand yeah. cases. Yeah. Um, so I, I, plucking numbers out of the air, I, I think we can pick up 200 uh, as, a, as a reasonable sample to start with and see what, what that tells us. That's right, uh, 10 to 10. 10. I think that's about right. Right, so what I've written is on recommendation one that the response of the Adult Social Care Director Appendix 2 detailing the recommendations, actions taken by adult social care and the learning arising from the local government and social care ombudsman report be endorsed. A letter be sent to all cases uh, over the last 12 months uh, asking if they have any concerns uh, over the process and a random sample of 200 cases over the last 12 months uh, be taken to look for any errors. Uh, Sue, you wish to come in. Sorry, Chair, can we also take on board the report back? And the report back and, and be reported back to the committee in July. I was going to suggest that we take out endorsed and put noted. Uh, right, be noted rather than endorsed. Yeah, at the yeah. end. I'm happy with yeah. that. I think most people will be. Um, have you got that, Debbie, um, our, our clerk? Do you want me to read it out again? Um, yes, if you could, Chairman, that would be great. Thank you. Yep. So uh, right at the very end of recommendation one, instead of the word endorsed, being, we, we change that to be noted and a letter be sent to all cases uh, uh, over the last 12 months um, asking if they wish to have a review or they feel that they, they need a review and a random sample of 200 cases over the last month be taken uh, to, to uh, check for any errors and be reported back to the committee in July. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Keith. I think that would be most helpful. And I think um, that would, 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 would help the committee um, look at that. Uh, further. As regards recommendation two, uh, if a working party be set up to review the adult social care reports and complaints on the local government and social care ombudsman, should uh, this matter be added to the works programme, I'm just going to ask for a general feeling of uh, members of the committee now if they wish that recommendation to go ahead. I'm going to start with the vice chair. Yes, chair, I think that would be useful. I mean, I think maybe not specifically on this, but on the systems. 
um, because it does seem that the systems are not easy to um, you know look at and that's that's maybe something that needs to needs to actually be considered I know that some of the L other LGS CO um, complaints have been to do with timely um, understanding of a financial difference and maybe there's something more systematic that needs to be looked at there Keith. Thank you. Um, I'll go down through the Cornwall councillors first and then I'll come to the other members. Councillor Frank, uh, recommendation two, do you think that's something that we should include? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gammon? Yes, please. Thank you. Councillor Jenkins already answered. Councillor Elvie, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Councillor Pugh? Yes, please. Councillor Nicholas? Yes, please. Thank you. I will now ask our other members, uh, Councillor Edwards. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm hoping I'm not going to miss anybody out here. Professor Dean. Yes, please. Reg. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Rob Bishop. Yes, please. Sally Vincent. Yes, please. Tony Woodhams. Yes, please. And have I missed anybody out, please? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to propose recommendation one and recommendation two uh, as set out uh, with the additions that uh, I've already included in that, which the letter be sent to all the cases over the last 12 months to ask if they wish to consider a review uh, and a random sample of 200 uh, cases be looked at and it be reported back to the committee in July. Um, I propose both recommendations to the committee and I look for a seconder, please. Vice Chair, Vice Chair hopefully. Yeah, happy to second it, Chair. Thank you. We'll go to the vote, please, Deborah. Uh, Debbie, sorry. I was saying Deborah. I don't know why they are too formal Being there. Told Deborah. Off. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry, Debbie. Debbie. Thank you very much, Chairman. So the recommendations are uh, as um, read by by the Chairman, uh, been proposed by the Chairman and seconded by the Vice Chairman, Councillor Jenkin. Uh, members, if I could go to the roll call vote, please. Councillor Alvey. Four. Councillor Frank. Four. Councillor Gammon. Four. Councillor Jenkin. Four. Councillor Nicholas. Four. Councillor Pugh. Four. And Councillor Wills. Four. Thank you, Members Chairman. The two recommendations have been agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we did make sure that uh, on recommendation one, we take out the word endorsed and put noted. Yes, Chairman, and recommendation two, we've added the word uh, systems as well as the reports and compliments. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And thank you very much, Keith, and thank you very much uh, for uh, coming to us this, this morning. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you again in July. Thanks very much. Yeah. yeah. And you haven't got an easy job, sir. We, we appreciate it. it's not an easy job that you do. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, none of us have an easy job to do, but uh, I'm sure that um, these steps will, will go some way to, to to helping everybody. And that's what we're here for, after all. That's fine, thanks very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, item nine on the agenda then um, is uh, any other business the chairman considers of urgency. I don't have any other business I consider to be of an urgent matter at the moment. Um, I would like to uh, wrap this meeting up by just saying to you all that uh, of course none of us know what the outcome uh, of the elections will be in May but I would like to take this opportunity to say a, a big thank you to all our officers who have been so helpful uh, with the committee over the last four years to Simon, to Ellie, to Matt, to Mel, um, also to our uh, independent non-elected members to Rob Bishop, Reg Davison, Merrill Dean, our 10 parish council members, uh, Dave Edwards, uh, Anthony Woodhams uh, are with us today, not with us today, Gloria and Hugh, and also to our Cornwall Council members, uh, which is Councillor Jenkin, Councillor uh, Elvie, Frank, Gammon, Nicholas, Pugh and Tudor, and not forgetting, of course, our parish 
Town Clerk Representative Sally Vincent. Uh, folks, it's been an honour and a pleasure uh, and a privilege for me to be your chairman over the last four years. Um, I have enjoyed it immensely. Um, I don't know what the outcome of the election will be and what the makeup of the new committee will be uh, post May uh, the 6th. But I would like to think that over the last four years we've done uh, some good work uh, on this committee um, and I thank you all for your time uh, and for your confidence and I would also like to thank my vice chair uh, Councillor Jenkin uh, for her um, help um, and guidance um, over the last four years. Um, we, I think we've been quite a good team together Love Day, I like to think so. Um, I know you were chairman for um, eight years um, and I've just done the last four um, but it has been uh, a great experience and thank you so very much indeed. I think it was only six years actually, Paul, or oh, less than that even, but... Uh... <laughs>